Okay, so very good. So uh, let me first really uh, thank a lot uh, the organizers of this workshop. I think it's uh, really great that uh, we are here um, under you know, the impulse of this uh, group of uh, young scholars. And I would also like to emphasize um, the uh, interdisciplinary nature of, of this workshop, which I think it's a very important element, and I will come back on this because I think it's something that we should really emphasize in uh, uh, as a uh, relevant development of our, of, uh, our research on, on the topic in the agenda today, for today. So, um, uh, so here I will be focusing uh, uh, mostly on uh, pricing algorithms. Um, so, uh, I, and I will set a little bit uh, what I think is the scene from my point of view as an economist. And I will tell you a little bit about my own research on the topic, um, uh, certainly leaving most of the details to uh, later presentation by uh, some of one, my, uh, one of my co-authors. Um, and then I will tell you uh, what is uh, a possible view on uh, um, for dealing with the uh, algorithmic pricing and uh, possible issues with algorithmic pricing. So first point is uh, just an observation that algorithms um, used for pricing are already there, are already in, in our markets, both in, in terms of um, expert systems and more advanced autonomous pricing algorithms. Here, what you see uh, uh, is just an example of um, algorithms uh, setting the price of commodities in, uh, in uh, Amazon marketplace. Uh, and if you want some more uh, data, uh, CMA, the UK uh, Competition Authorities, uh, has studied um, uh, third party sellers in Amazon and in 2018. Uh, more or less one third of the of them were using already uh, algorithms, and a similar similar figure also came about for uh, in general line sellers uh, in a study by the European Commission. Um, and what I think it's interesting is also the existence of kind of booming industry, which is called repricing industry. It's an industry of software companies that uh, actually provide. Uh, uh, pricing services to sellers. It's kind of opaque industry that is uh, quickly growing. And I say opaque because we don't know exactly what type of algorithms these software companies are using. Uh, there is probably some hype there as well. Uh, as you can see here, some of them claim to use game theory, which we don't know exactly what they mean. Uh, and, um, and what is interesting also is to notice that these companies are uh, really providing uh, turnkey services where even small companies can uh, buy for some money uh, different types of um, uh, services, pricing services for their commodities uh, at different level of quality of services. And just a casual observation, I, I uh, searched on the web for these companies and the prices four years ago. And if I remember well, the price for monthly subscription of repricing was around 40 euros or dollars. Now things are kind of prices have kind of skyrocketed, uh, but maybe just casual observation. Um, so um, there are really uh, many claims about the, uh, you know, abilities of repricing softwares. Uh, here are some uh, claims by companies that sell these services. Uh, so algo pricing, mask, master market volatility with AI powered precision pricing. They respond to market events, to competitor changes. And to some extent, they also acting at superhuman expertise. As I said, there is a little bit of hype there. But some of these claims are certainly uh, actual and relevant. Um, algorithms tend to incorporate, we know, market conditions, for example, prices, own prices, and competitor prices uh, present and in the past. We don't know exactly the memory of these algorithms. They track uh, own sales volumes, inventories, cost, and also ex external events like weather conditions. 
Um, so, um, which exactly, as I said, which pricing algorithms are using the market in this repricing software industry? We don't know exactly. They could be just adapted learning models or reinforcement learning models. Um, there is, I think, a lot to investigate here to know uh, and, and many important details. So let me just emphasize that algorithms in uh, uh, market activities nowadays are not just in use for pricing, are certainly, as uh, Robo also mentioned before, uh, used for other activities like product designs, in choosing characteristics of service and products, in quality, and also in information and advertising. And so I would like to suggest here a slightly broader view on algorithms used for market and not just pricing. So my idea is I will focus more on prices, but I would like to emphasize that what I'm gonna say is I think relevant also for um, other users of algorithms in markets. So a few words on what are the benefits of using algorithms in market? You know, I'm an economist and we are obsessed with demand and supply, here you go. Uh, pricing algorithms are uh, uh, very effective in quickly adapting to demand changes. You know, if you have a demand and supply associated with equilibrium price and quantity, if you have an increase in demand at some point and prices do not quickly adjust, then quantity will not uh, change as, so, as long as prices are unaffected because sellers will continue to sell the same quantity. And this is a waste both of profits for sellers and also computer, uh, consumer service. So um, uh, the ability to quickly adjust to market conditions is efficiency and Nancy. There is no doubt about that. And algorithms are, are very effective in doing this. And the repricing and the ability to adjust quickly to market condition also for small firms uh, which uh, may then buy some of the services I was mentioning before, is certainly uh, increasing the, um, the ability of even small players to be uh, active in markets and so may actually uh, end up enhancing entry and competition and product var variety for the benefit of consumers. Um, and also price personalization, which is something that you can do with the algorithms, can increase competition. For example, algorithms can target uh, uh, switcher, con switchers consumers, consumers that are ready to move uh, and shop around different uh, uh, sellers. So algorithms may spot these type of consumers and poach them uh, uh, to, to the benefit of the consumers again. And let me also mention that personalization of product recommendation may also save a lot of time and uh, uh, to consumers. Now, of course, uh, that's the, uh, that was the benefit side. Now, what are the risks? What, what are the theories of arms that we can conceive about algorithms? There will be some discussion, I'm sure, and I will say a few words later on, on collusion. But let me also mention uh, the risk associated with per price personalization. Personalization is always, you know, a double-edged uh, sword. So, so you always have a bright side and negative side with personalization in economics. Uh, personalization can easily turn into exploitation of uh, vulnerable, for example, inattentive consumers with significant distributive effects. And, uh, and firms can try to use obfuscation and opaque pricing technique uh, that can be enhanced by sophisticated pricing algorithms. Uh, a second issue, could, another issue could be algorithmic discrimination. We already know of cases of uh, unfair and biased decisions by, uh, uh, taken by algorithms. And in terms of recommendation, there is a risk of manipulation and, and, uh, and somehow perils of uh, uh, collaborative filtering. So uh, before I go to price and algorithm, let me spend a few words on a, uh, something that I have on my research agenda I'm working on. It's precisely algorithms used for recommender system. So if you look, for example, Amazon Marketplace, we know that eight, nine, 80, 90 percent of all what is uh, bought in Amazon goes through the buy box, which is one form of uh, uh, recommendation. And we are nowadays immersed in recommendations because actually we live in an ocean of options that is very difficult to screen. So then 
uh, thanks to recommendation, we can see, listen to music that we like, videos, movies, we can see movies that we like and so on and so forth. But of course, there is a, uh, so recommender system comes with, with some risk. Uh, they can be easily manipulated, uh, for example, uh, uh, leading to self-preferencing. And what I think is interesting and, and, and just mentioning what I'm, I'm currently studying is the possibility that uh, the very same algorithms that are used for recommendation uh, have embedded some potential issues. So most of the modern algorithms for recommendation are based on recommend, uh, sorry, collaborative filtering, which I can summarize saying that you are recommended as a consumer something that people similar to you have uh, previously consumed. And so it's important to understand what the implication for product market shares this type of recommendation may have. And what is the effects also on the fact that these recommender systems are fed with data that are themselves generated uh, in a feedback loop by the recommender system. So there is an issue of endogeneity. But let's go back to pricing algorithms and some specific concerns. One specific concern is that uh, 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 by a, a, this quick ability to react to market, to detect market changes and behavior of other players, uh, the automation that comes with the uh, uh, algorithmic pricing increases uh, the ability to su uh, uh, su support collusion. And, and second concern is that if firms are using the algorithms that are provided by the same companies, the repricing software companies that was mentioned before, then you have a common intermediary that can uh, you know, behave like a hub and spoke model facilitating collusion. And the last point, uh, which is the subject of uh, my own research is the possibility that algorithms actually learn autonomously if they're not designed to do so, they learn to collude and actually learn uh, to uh, punish competitors' uh, price deviations. Um, so instead of, as I said, going into the details of uh, tacit collusion and my own research, Emilio Calvano will discuss a little bit later on in the, in the day, let me mention uh, the difficulties that we ha may have facing empirical analysis on algorithmic tacit collusion. So here are the challenges for this type of empirical analysis. There are very few papers, uh, actually just one uh, significant paper that would say a few words, few words in, in a moment. The challenges are that first you have to properly identify the adoption by, by sellers of algorithms, which is typically something not publicly observed. And second, the second challenge is that um, the adoption actually may be endogenous and correlated with other factors that we do not observe as researchers. So we may attribute in a wrong way the implication uh, of, uh, of uh, price adoption, uh, algorithmic pricing adoption. And this is the third problem. Even if you observe price increase, it may be difficult to separate, for example, price increases uh, uh, generated by algorithmic collusion from price increases that we may observe simply for price discrimination, for example. Now, there is this interesting paper by Assad and others and quarters uh, that relies on data on German retail uh, petrol stations. And they, they uh, observe that a software company, A2I Systems, announced the, um, the launch of a, uh, pricing algorithms for uh, petrol stations in 2017. And so they conducted, these researchers conducted a, some uh, analysis. Um, they first tested for adoption, uh, checking, uh, for looking for structural breaks in pricing behavior, and they identified 30% of petrol stations in Germany you are adopting uh, these algorithms. And then with the instrumental variable approach in order to address this uh, uh, endogeneity issue I was mentioning before, uh, they were actually able to check the uh, consequence of price adoption. So I think results are very interesting. First result, they noticed that if a pump station has no local competitors in a significant uh, uh, neighboring area, then the adoption of algorithms has no effect at all on prices. If competitors instead are there, 
then adoption of algorithm allows to increase margins significantly, price cost margins significantly by 9%. Even more so, if the market, relevant market for, for the station is a duopoly, then the increased margin is really significant, 28%. And what is interesting is that margins, when margins increase, they don't increase immediately. It takes more or less one year. So it takes time, in a sense, to, for the algorithms to be able to elaborate the data they collect and then uh, take this decision, which in the case of competitors, as I was mentioning before, is price increase. So interesting, these observations um, are also fully consistent with my own research. And I would uh, somehow uh, urge you to ask yourself, given this set of results, what is a plausible explanation for adopting uh, these pricing uh, algorithms? Look at point one, if there is no competition, algorithms have no effect. If there is competition, algorithms have effect in increasing prices. Now, how to deal with these issues? How to deal with the possibility, uh, which becomes more and more, at least to me, uh, realistic of algorithmic algorithmic collusion? We can have market reactions. And here, Mikal has a great idea. Um, not only we can think about algorithmic sellers using algorithmic pricing, we can also conceive, conceive algorithmic consumers who, by means of using algorithmic protect, themselves. This is something that was already going on, for example, in uh, robo-advising financial markets. Robo-advising, it's algorithms that help consumers, uh, investors to choose the best uh, investment strategy for them. And I think also platforms may have a role here. And Justin Johnson will talk later, I guess, on, on this thing. And probably also firms and sellers as well, as well may have, should have a role. Now, let me now go a little bit out of my uh, area and invade a little bit the area of law scholars. So tacit collusion that could be learned by uh, pricing algorithms, it, I think it's a problem nowadays. It's a problem because currently the law and the jurisprudence on, uh, on collusion is that even though we know that the problem with that is high prices, uh, currently, uh, what is legal, illegal, sorry, is the process that lead to high prices, not high prices per se. And the, especially what is illegal in this process is the communication that leads to uh, high prices. So given that tacit collusion can actually take place without communication, they are currently uh, lawful. I know that it is a little bit extreme view, but you know, economists tend to cut uh, things very simple. So where do we go from here? Here, and in the last few minutes, I will uh, discuss briefly uh, the result of research I've done and conducted recently. Um, so a possibility that I would like to discuss here is the following. So the process of collusion currently, human collusion, goes through, as I said, communication, then through the ability to adopt collusion pricing rules coordinated by this communication, which ultimately leads to high prices. Now, the difficulty here is that uh, the collusion pricing rules are non-discoverable. You cannot ask a manager, tell me what's your pricing strategy. Of course, the managers will adapt uh, his answer or her answer to this, to this question. We also know that uh, prices, even though they are observable, they are difficult to assess and to evaluate because there is always a way to justify as high prices in terms, for example, of, of uh, high costs. So that's why, this is my interpretation, why uh, the current status on collusion is that we have focused on communication. Communication is discoverable. And if you find communication uh, uh, between firms leading to collusion, then this is what is meant to be illegal. Now, with algorithmic collusion, the problem is that communication is not necessary. So with my research, I've shown that algorithms may be able to lend uh, to collusion without communication. But the novelty here, and I think this is key, is that latent uh, uh, pricing rules are discoverable. This is the Achilles heel, if you want, 
um, of algorithmic collusion. Uh, so we, and then the idea here is to go from a communication approach for uh, feed, um, uh, um, dealing with algorithmic collusion to a rule of conduct uh, approach. So there can be an exact uh, way to implement this analysis. That is, you can vet and uh, uh, check algorithms before they are deployed in the market. I think this is really not viable because it's a formidable task. Computer scientists are very uh, uh, articulate and original in offering every day, more or less, new algorithms and with many variants. But what I think it's important here is that we can think about a consent, a, a, sorry, a census of algorithms, which I think would be very useful and doable. So sellers, for example, may announce that they're using publicly, they announce that they're using pricing algorithms. And possibly they may also announce to authorities what type or what class of algorithms are using. This is already, by the way, in place in, uh, for example, in Europe for financial markets. And the exposed approach instead, I think we probably is more promising, is, is based on the idea when we observe a sorry, suspicious events like price changes or price behavior, we can uh, ask firms to show us what type of algorithms and uh, actually audit uh, algorithms, for example, in virtual markets, and check for what I said, rule of conduct. Rule of conduct may, may allow us to check, for example, the presence of price matching rules uh, and price uh, ability to engage in price war, wars and, and punishments in presence of uh, deviation. So behavior that is inconsistent with competitive pricing. I understand that this is a tricky point, but I think economists and, and law scholars may really be very useful here in digging more than what we did so far on checking what we can conceive as inconsistent behavior with respect to uh, respect to competitive price, and by the way, this checking ability should also uh, could also be delegated and uh, become a responsibility of firms that are actually using uh, uh, algorithms. And let me conclude then with just few ideas that I uh, discovered. I think were quite interesting coming from uh, the computer science uh, uh, academic literature. One idea is explainability. You know that algorithms uh, powered by artificial intelligence may be easily become very um, difficult to understand, to, so they easily become black boxes. So computer scientists have started to think about the possibility to impose explainability and interpretability. And there are two approaches. One approach is and, uh, 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 having artificial intelligence algorithms that are transparent by design. And there is a post hoc explainability condition, which essentially requires that ex post, we are able to convert the behavior of complicated algorithms in order to be interpretable. So what is the best approach for market algorithms? I think that there is a, in, an interesting uh, uh, research to go here. And the last point is on fairness. Computer scientists have started to think how to embed fairness in artificial intelligence algorithms. We know that algorithms can be unfair. We already have cases, uh, uh, observed cases about unfairness in algorithms. So there are some general principles that the, um, uh, that the uh, academic, uh, the academia in computer science are developing accountability and responsibility of developers and notice also of users of artificial intelligence in order to monitor fairness. Awareness and competence that not developer and users as a condition to use uh, uh, AI algorithms uh, and some degree of human oversight in any case and the possibility to independently audit uh, algorithms as I was mentioning before in the case of colluding algorithms the ability to have explainable, as I was saying before, and interpretable artificial intelligence. And we also know that artificial intelligence algorithms can be constrained, for example, with regularization methods in order to abide certain rules that we want to impose. So take home message for me as an economist is that algorithms are in markets already there. And I think it's a fascinating and urgent research agenda 
for computer scientists, economists, and legal scholars. This is truly interdisciplinary research in the sense that I, sure, I am sure that none of these groups independently will have the tools and the ability to address these issues. And, and stop here, and I'm sorry for being a little bit longer over time. Thank you.